So welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Andre Mihaly. I'm a contributor to several open source projects and mostly contributing to, and, uh, to PyR server and supporting uh, people using the server because of, um, I work most of the time for a company that develops uh, this open source project and provides support for it. But I'm, I'm also uh, uh, working on some uh, Eclipse uh, projects in Eclipse Foundation. And today I'm going to talk about uh, scalable applications, or actually how we can make applications uh, so, that are, so that they are scalable. But first, let me ask you a question. Uh, how many of you uh, have thought or are thinking about uh, increased load in the future when you design your applications, when you write the code? How, how many of you can imagine? Yeah, okay, quite a few. Not everybody, obviously. It's, it's pretty okay. I, I also don't do it most of the time. I just want to get the code done, to do what, what is required to do and don't care how it will perform in uh, production scenarios. Most of the time, uh, we don't have requirements, requirements for that, because business people also can't tell most of the time what will be the load on the application, and they don't know that it's good to put it into the requirements so that uh, testers can set up performance tests and uh, uh, check if the application meets these requirements. And often they, they don't know how the, requirement, how the load will increase in the time. So even if the, uh, the performance requirements are in the specification, it can change in the time. So what actually is scalability? What are scalable applications? And how scalability can help us to achieve some goals of performance in the future? without rewriting the applications from the ground up. Is it just a buzzword? Or is it really something useful that we need to think about when we want to keep the performance uh, at a good levels in the future? And something even, <laughs> even bigger you might, uh, might hear from some business people or some other maybe clever people, highly scalable applications a bigger buzzword. That's great. <laughs> but uh, let's come down to earth. Is it really important? And uh, I'd like to summarize why it's scalability is important, is important and what is the, the uh, description or what is our goal with scalable applications. So I, I, I would describe it uh, as the ability to, of an application or a system or anything uh, to increase uh, its performance to do the job faster when we add just more resources without changing the application or maybe changing it a bit, tweaking it here and there, but uh, without really rewriting the application. But often scalability is, is not easy because applications, normal applications, are not designed uh, to be scalable and uh, even if they are, they often fail. Uh, because you know it from, from real world, uh, even when, when you put more people on the work, it doesn't mean the, uh, that the job gets done faster because there's increased communication between the people. It's the same in the application. When you have lots of moving parts, you want to increase the load, so add more resources but it doesn't mean that the application will consume the resources effectively. Oh. So we need what we can do with our application to make it scale. In a simple way, we can just scale it vertically. It means running it on multiple nodes. Oh, no, running it, it on, on the same nodes but uh, increase uh, the CPU power, in, uh, essentially run it on a better hardware. It's very easy to do, although quite costly, if we really want to increase uh, the power uh, of the machine. And it works with most of the applications, even those that are not designed uh, for scalability upfront. 
but it's limited by physics. It's very expensive when it's exponentially expensive if we really want to get to the top performance. So another option we have is uh, horizontal scaling. And again, it's kind of buzzword if you don't know the difference, but the real difference is that you can put additional resources uh, to already running applications. You don't need to change the hardware, you just put additional hardware next to it, and you can replicate the application to run on multiple nodes, to use more resources, to spread across more resources. And you can be more granular, you can separate uh, the application to, into smaller parts and run some of those parts on uh, uh, more, more machines, some of, the, some of the other parts on less machines if, if the uh, load is not distributed evenly on these components. But it also adds more complexity because it's now parallel. And you know distributed programming is not easy. So we suddenly face all those complexities of distributed programming. We need to think about things like de deadlocks, things, things like the starvation, everything which we need to uh, care about when we, uh, when we use threads in our application, but on, on a much higher level. We also need to take care of uh, fa failures, because once the application is spread across network on multiple different uh, hardwares, it's much easier to, or much, much more frequent to get an error, error and the error is, uh, is present always with uh, distributed program, with distributed applications. And once we get, get across the uh, network, we have increased communication because it's not, uh, no longer communication within one ma machine, one, one process, but it's across network. And when, get, when network gets slow, uh, the application can get slower. So not always, if the application is not well designed, you, you don't get always better performance, but more generally you do, you, you do get the, uh, better performance when you uh, scale horizontally. And really a bottleneck can be a shared state, a problem which we need to solve somehow. The state needs to be either, either distributed to every node or we need to avoid it somehow. So there's, a, there's even a law which can be used to, uh, to uh, estimate how good is an application in, case of or in terms of scalability, how well it can be scaled with more resources. And the, um, the Amdahl's law is very general. It doesn't speak about applications, it speaks in general terms. And it's, uh, the implication of this law is that the speed up of anything is limited by the parts that don't benefit, don't use the additional resources. If there, is some, uh, if there are some bottlenecks, uh, for example, waiting or something or, or synchronization of some tasks, uh, the tasks can't continue uh, further processing and can, can't use more threads, more CPU power and resource. So it's good to avoid any uh, bottlenecks that would prevent parallelization. Otherwise, we don't benefit with additional resources as much as we want to do. Here is where in-memory data, data grids can help us. So what is essentially an in-memory data grid? How, how many of you have heard about these? Not so many. Maybe you know about the implementations, Hazelcast, Infinispan, anything like that, distributed cache, memcache. Not so many. <laughs> these uh, in-memory data grids uh, are uh, components or uh, libraries, applications, whatever, how, how you want to use them, uh, they provide distributed shared state. That's one advantage, that you don't need to uh, do the synchronization of the state um, yourself in your applications. But moreover, they do it in a clever way, because uh, it can be done uh, very easily by replicating all the state to every node in the cluster, but then 
as we, we, if we need more data, the data would be distributed on every node, and the heap would increase, would be increased on every node. Another way how to do this is to keep the data on one node, but the other nodes would need to uh, ask always where's the data and ask it on, uh, of, uh, uh, across the cluster, ask every node and get the data from it. And data grids usually do do this more effectively. They somehow do some, something in similar uh, in in between. They spread the data across the cluster, but on, not on every node. They automatically uh, uh, distribute the data up to several replicas. And usually, it's it's good. It's enough because uh, we need only that many replicas to cover any any failure. So. If we expect that at the most two or three nodes would be down at the same time, in a short time, uh, we would need uh, three or four replicas to cover this scenario. But this is only for the time when uh, the data gets again uh, distributed evenly. So this is also what uh, data grids do. In case of failures, they immediately recognize the failure nodes and they replicate the data again. It would increase the heap size because uh, the, the memory is lost on, on the lost nodes, but then we can also add more nodes or start, start new nodes, restart the failed nodes, and it will automatically, again, evenly distribute the, the, the data. And uh, memory data grids uh, also provide means uh, to synchronize applications in the, in the cluster, all those distributed uh, primitives like logs, queues, topics. And executors are especially uh, convenient for some applications which uh, deal with very high loads of data. Oh, sorry. Most of the data grids provide a uh, simplified programming model, so you don't need to uh, deal with low-level deta details. You just access uh, common structures like map, set, and they get all distributed. So some parts of these structures are uh, stored locally, some parts of, of the structures are distributed on several nodes, and they are repli replicated. So if you have uh, more replicas, you, if you configure the, uh, a structure to have more replicas, it will be always replicated on some several nodes. Uh, they also provide service discovery and load balancing, because uh, the, the cluster in, in the cluster, every node knows about each other. So uh, it can uh, uh, send information to every node without, without uh, really needing some, some sort of a service discovery or service registration. Um, and with some structures, you can do load balancing easily. For example, a queue, you send a message to a queue, and it will be picked up by one of the nodes. And uh, the distributed execution is especially nice thing. It's not very common to use it, but uh, uh, it means that you can send instructions to each node, and the no nodes will execute the instruction and bring back the data. And for some applications, this is really convenient because the amounts of data are much much higher than the amount than the 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 size of the instruction. You know, the code is very, very often just a formula, and if it can be serialized, it can be sent to other nodes, executed, and, and the, the aggregated results are uh, pulled back. So it's very efficient in, uh, in terms of communication and data exchange. And what is the bonus? It's a memory, so we don't need to uh, map uh, the, the objects from memory to any, any form of database structures. We just need to serialize them, and uh, JVM, for, fortunately, provides default serialization mechanism. We can write our own if we want to make it more efficient, but it's not necessary if it's okay for us. Uh, here are some examples of the data grids I mentioned. Uh, there are a lot more uh, of them. I just listed those I think are most well known. And what is most well known to me is Hazelcast, so I will just I will talk more about it into detail. But m much of it also applies to other uh, data grids. 
So Hazelcast is uh, uh, another distributed uh, in-memory data grid. You can embed it into your application, and when you start it from your application, it tries to immediately connect to other instances on the cluster. So if you, can, if you start your application multiple times, it doesn't matter if it's on the same computer or on other computers on the, on the same network. It can even be across several networks. If uh, you, you can use different joiners to instruct uh, the Hazelcast node to connect to the other nodes. And when they are connected, they form a cluster so that every node knows about each other. If some nodes uh, cease to be responsive, the cluster or the ev every node finds out about it and will drop the, uh, the node from the cluster and distribute the data, which are replicated on other nodes. So the data is not lost if uh, a member of the cluster is down, because if you have more replicas of the data, they are somehow scattered across the cluster and they are duplicated. Hazelcast also provides the uh, ability to run light nodes without data. These are nodes uh, which don't hold the data, which always request the data from other nodes. And also when they store the data, they all only send it to other nodes. It's very important in, to, uh, if you really want to write performant applications and avoid big heap sizes colliding with your logic. But I, will, I will explain later. And also, there's an option to use off-heap data. If, you know, you know, the memory in JVM is stored on a heap, and it's not very efficient. Uh, someone explained to me on one presentation that even a, s a string's empty string con uh, consumes several bytes, I think 50 bytes of memory. So you can imagine that storing high amounts of objects is not very ep efficient on a heap. And if you... If this is a limit for you, you can store uh, the data in a separate uh, native process which stores uh, the data in memory more efficiently. It also provides, other, Hazelcast provides other features, but uh, I'll stop talking now about slides. I'll try to show you these features in practice. So, so what I'll do, what I already prepared, is a smooth, first a simple application with Hazelcast to demonstrate how, how it's used and what are its, advant its advantages. But before I start using Hazelcast, I start with a simple application. It just starts a server. Uh, exposes a REST resource. I'll run it in the meantime. And what it does, it uh, starts a Jersey REST uh, endpoint or REST uh, connector on top of a Grizzly HTTP server. So it's very, very fast, very simple. It runs under a second, but it doesn't do much. It just exposes one service that accesses that data from database. And uh, if the data is, uh, is slow, if I access the resource, it takes a while to load. How do we get it bigger? Yeah. So the, re the REST resource will get me several objects in response, but it took eight seconds. If I execute it again, it will again go to the database and try to get the resource from the database, and it will again take a long time. This time it's shorter because of some random event, but it usually is, is long. What we can do here is we can improve this to make our application faster and to, to pull data from database, spread it across the cluster so that every node in the cluster, if we scale the application, has access to the data fast. So it improves performance immediately uh, and avoids uh, too many database accesses. We can use uh, several structures from Hazelcast here. We can use a distributed map, 
to put uh, data into the map once they are retrieved and check the map before we check the, the database. Uh, there is a distributed set, but what I'm using in, uh, in my demo application is, uh, is a common API to access caches and to manipulate with caches, uh, which is very useful because uh, you can then s plug in different caching provider with the same, which provides the same API. And you don't need to have to use uh, Hazelcast, you can use uh, uh, local uh, cache, which is not distributed, which is faster, obviously. Uh, it's for, for development, but for production you can uh, even choose something maybe better, maybe, maybe something commercial, because Hazel Hazelcast is in its enterprise version commercial, but it's also available as an open source. But if you really want to use something and you believe some, some closed source solution is better, you can plug it. So let's go to the second version of the application. And what I actually did here is uh, no, this one. I changed the, the main class so that it actually starts Hazelcast. It starts Hazelcast via the standard caching API, so it retrieves a caching provider. This is a Hazelcast because it's on the class pass. I could change it for something else. And I just uh, run start the server afterwards. And what I need to do more is with, without, with doing this, it wouldn't change how the application behaves. It would just start Hazelcast, which wouldn't, which wouldn't do anything. So if I really want to make use of Hazelcast, I need to store the data into, into the distributed cache, distributed uh, memory structure. So what I can do is to wrap every call to the database. Here, I, uh, the database access is implemented as a DAO object. So with a simple application like this, I can just extend the object and, and switch these uh, implementations. So instead of uh, the scheduled DAO, which was original data access object so which I used, I will use uh, cached scheduled DAO, which extends it and intercepts uh, the gather methods. And what it does is it tries to get all schedules from cache, so it uh, retrieves all, all the this method uh, retrieves all the schedules, which are objects, uh, up to the limit, which is a parameter. So if we want to have uh, just 50 schedules, we will pass 50 as a parameter. It's not very good or very clever to retrieve all, because we don't know how many of them would be, and the result would be really, really big in if, if we have a big database. So what it, what it does is try, it tries to retrieve the data from the cache. And cache schedule is, uh, is a standard cache provided by Hazelcast or any other provider. And we need to first uh, initialize it, create the cache. Uh, we can give it a name so that it can be accessed from some other places under the same name. And then we can use it as, as a map, basically. We can use it with more functionality, but you can imagine it's just a simple map. And you, we can put uh, data into it with uh, key value pairs. And we can get uh, data from it as entries, which I will I convert to to values, and uh, I with this code I go over all the values up to up to a certain limit, and uh, convert the the key value entry to only a value and uh, accumulate those collect those in a, uh, in a list, and in the end, if uh, the result side is is smaller than the limit, so I requested more data than is actually in the cache, I need to retrieve the data. Or if the data is not there at all, I need to retrieve the data. So actually only at this point, 
I will go to the database, I will call the original DAO, and then read, read the data. It is also important to, uh, to put the red data into the cache. So next time uh, the method is called, it will stay in the, in the memory. So the, the re retrieval is faster. And then I re retrieve the, or return back the results. So it's either result that we retrieve from in-memory database or from real database. But if it's in-memory database, uh, it's much faster. So if we start this application, takes a little more time because it initializes Hazelcast and Hazelcast attempts to discover other nodes that it would connect to. And now the first request is still slow because it needs to go to the database. To the database. But uh, once it's finished, subsequent requests are much faster. You see, it's like 10, ten fold, 10 times faster. Uh, now we have a little problem. If we uh, stop the application and restart it, all the data in the cache is lost. And uh, it wouldn't make sense in the real world to drop the data because then we uh, lose, uh, lose the capability of the distributed memory to, to keep the memory in, in a fast cache. So what we can do with Hazelcast is we can start just a simple node without any application which actually just starts Hazelcast. And the second node, only the Hazelcast node, will connect to the first node. It knows how to, how to discover it. And now we have two nodes. One is running our application. The application is sending data to the distributed memory, retrieving the data from there. But uh, yeah, data is, data is there. But even if we stop the first application, yeah, you can see it's, it's not there, and start it again. See, the result takes a little longer than before, but much faster than if it was reading the data from database. So what happened there is it first asked cache if the data is there, but the cache didn't find the, any data locally because uh, the local node was just restarted. So it asked other instances in the cluster, the second instance, and it had the data. So the additional time needed to re process this, re this request was just uh, overhead of sending the data from one node to another and also distributed the, the data uh, to, to the new node. And subsequent, uh, subsequent uh, requests are faster because the data is already on our local node because it was pulled uh, if by previous requests. But if we didn't have the second node, the request would take uh, several seconds, not only two seconds, but five, six seconds because it was go to the database. So this is what we can get uh, with Hazelcast. If we uh, put the data in a distributed memory, we can improve the performance even of a single application, but if we scale the application horizontally, we get improved in for performance for every application because now if, if we didn't distribute the cache, uh, some, some application could change the data in the cache because we are now, now we are just reading the data. But imagine if uh, the application would write the data. It, could, it can decide either to write the data into the cache or write the data into the database and clear the cache so that cache is uh, refreshed. And if it decides only to write the data into the cache and it's not available to other nodes, other nodes wouldn't know about this change 
and you would have discrepancies in data. So the only two options, reasonable options, is are either to clear the cache and uh, change the database, which is shared by all the nodes, or distribute the cache without accessing the, the database. You can guess what is better. Uh, I will also show you how uh, you can use this in uh, enterprise applications. You know, big projects running on application servers, some of them using Java E. I know many of such applications use Spring or other frameworks and avoid what is <laughs> offered by application servers for, for various reasons, some for good, some for bad. Uh, but uh, with uh, Fire Server, which is an application server derived from Glassfish, you can uh, write or, and run enterprise applications using standard Java E API and having this type of, uh, of distributed memory embedded. You can also use Hazelcast in any up enterprise application if you bundle it with your application or if you can in somehow plug it into your server or you can use any other distributed memory. But Fire Server has it out of the box and it's uh, nicely integrated together. So just for comparison, I will show you quickly the code, how it changed when we use uh, Java E API and uh, integration of uh, Fire Server with the Hazelcast cluster, uh, with Hazelcast. So with Java EE, we don't have a main class. We just uh, can, can start some things uh, with uh, even listeners, or we can just declare them so that they are automatically picked up by the server. So instead of main class, uh, which starts Hazelcast, we will rely on the Hazelcast already present in Pyre server. So those, there's no need to start it. We just need to declare our uh, our resource, and the resource is again a Jaxar as res resource, but we now can use the injection. That's one of the APIs provided by Java EE. Uh, it's dependency injection mechanism, which we don't have just in plain Java, uh, Java application. And uh, we can also look at the difference here, what we changed. We can compare the REST resource, it's not much different. Just instead of uh, creating a static instance or using static instance, we inject uh, the DAO. This is convenient because we can easily extend the, the standard EDAO without changing the REST resource. Here in the first example, we needed to change the, the static uh, instance from scheduled DAO to cache scheduled DAO. But here with the dependency injection, we can just uh, and configure the application somewhere else. And we actually do. We provide a specialized bean which covers or replaces the scheduled DAO. With CDI, if you use specializes annotation, the, the container will automatically discover this bean and use it in every places where normally it would use uh, scheduled DAO. And this means we can uh, inject or we can uh, uh, intercept all the methods of the original object automatically everywhere where, where the ob original object would be uh, ex executed. So we do this by extending get all schedules and the code that we had before in the, in the uh, get schedule DLs remains the same except when we compare it's uh, much easier to read and much with much less boilerplate. What is now easier? Oh. It's switched things. Here on the right is, is what was before. Here on the left is what is now. So we can uh, get rid of all this uh, all this stuff that. Uh, initializes the, the cache and um, 
starts the cache or retrieves, uh, retrieves the instance of the cache, we can uh, just inject it. Th this is provided by, by our server. It's not, uh, it's not a standard way of doing this uh, in Java EE because Java EE doesn't provide jcache API out of the box. But uh, it's, uh, this mechanism or this API reuses the, the dependency injection. It just uh, adds configuration to inject a cache if you just really want to inject a cache. So it does this uh, behind the scenes. It uh, calls Hazelcast, uh, create, uh, gets a manage, catch manager, and gets a catch and inject it into this. If you want to give it a name as before, we can use uh, just a notation to, to name it. And that's it. We can use it later in the same way. So if, if I start this on the PyR server, uh, it would behave the same, obviously. It would uh, consume more memory because the server, server starts more things, but uh, not inevitably. Okay, let's go to the presentation now. What's PyR server? PyR server, as I said, is uh, uh, derived from Glassfish and it embeds Hazelcast. And it, doesn't, it does provide JKC CDI integration, which I showed you, but it also uh, provides alternative uh, engine uh, to replicate HTTP sessions on top of what, what is available from, uh, uh, with Glassfish. And it can replicate the uh, HTTP sessions over Hazelcast. So you can start, enable Hazelcast and replicate everything in the same way. And Hazelcast uh, adds more flexibility than the previous solution. Uh, Pyra server also offers uh, a simple message bus over CDI events, so it uh, uh, provides API to send just plain uh, events uh, in, um, uh, over to remote Hazelcast instances, or remote Pyra server instances over Hazelcast. It's only necessary to serialize the, the event payload, and then it can be observed on other instances. Uh, there is also uh, a Pyra Micro, which is a distribution of uh, Pyra that can be run from command line. It's uh, derived from an embedded version of Glassfish, and it can be also embedded, but also executed as a, as a standalone jar. And you can provide applications to run on uh, on command line by either uh, uh, providing a file with the application or path to the file, or you can bundle the application and the runtime together so that you can, uh, you can get uh, executable Uber jar. So now we get to the point where we have everything, or more or less, I hope you understand, how you can design your applications to be scalable. And uh, at least, uh, I, I show you at least one tool, one way of doing this. Uh, to use distributed memory, distributed caches, and you can also use all other distributed uh, struct, uh, uh, distributed uh, functions in uh, in memory data grids, like distributed executors. And this is quite seamless because uh, the API seems like everything is running locally, but you can easily uh, tweak where things are executed, and you can also play with uh, the topology of the cluster. It doesn't have to be just simple uh, cluster of same nodes, but it can change what is uh, run on different nodes. With one thing, one simple um, thing you can do with a cluster is just increase the number of nodes in the cluster. Uh, with Hazelcast and you know, in memory data grids, it's uh, very easy because you don't have to think about distributed uh, data, it distributes automatically. Uh, without that, you would need to cr set up a load balancer with st sticky sessions or somehow avoid shared state. Uh, with uh, the in-memory data, data grids, you can rely on the data to be distributed everywhere. So it doesn't matter uh, what the, the load balancer does, it can just randomly uh, send a request to any, any node and it is, it's available. Uh, it has the, the data that uh, are requested uh, or necessary for the request, and any node can finish the request. That's pretty simple. 
But uh, if you have too much data in memory, or first, no, that's the third thing. If, if you too much access uh, the database uh, with every node, uh, it's better to have it in memory. It uh, improves the performance of each node. But if you do this, you can r quickly run out of memory because the data is stored on the heap together with uh, all the other memory that is re required uh, by, uh, by business logic. So to avoid uh, running out of memory in the heap, you can start additional instances to add more distributed memory. These instances wouldn't run any application. They don't have to. They just provide Hazelcast node to store the data. And the Hazelcast, what it does, it distributes all the data. So it takes some data from the old nodes and decreases the, the size of the heap uh, it uses on these old nodes and takes this data and put, put it uh, into, onto the new nodes. So you can easily uh, uh, move the data uh, into multiple uh, places. It also increases resilience because uh, when you have uh, data on multiple nodes, uh, you can e much, easy, much more easily recover. You can increase uh, the number of replicas and you can even restart all, all the applications. You can upgrade your application without losing the data. So you can restart one after one application, but you can also re restart all of them to, um, and still have the data. With this uh, kind of approach, you can easily turn Hazelcast cluster into a in-memory database, which is always running, stores all the data. And with this, we get to another point. There is a schema, how it looks like. But uh, another point is to move the data from your applications to, uh, to other nodes that just store the data. Why is this important? It's important because, as I said, sometimes uh, the data that are stored in, the, in, in shared memory clash with the, with the short-lived living data that are necessary to process requests. And when you want to have requests uh, processed fast, you want to decrease the amount of memory uh, consumed by the heap so that uh, there are less uh, garbage collector invocations, and the memory has, uh, can be increased and decreased uh, very, uh, very fast without, uh, being in, uh, without the rest of the memory being consumed by the persistent data. So what, what is a good idea is to have uh, nodes which only run applications and have the necessary memory that is um, uh, required by the, the application itself just for, to process the request and separate the, the long-term data in the cache and in distributed memory uh, into different instances. This is possible with the Hazelcast light nodes, which are also supported by Pyra. You can easily start Pyra with a Hazelcast light, uh, in Hazelcast light mode. And um, it also enables you to tweak uh, JVM settings on the performance nodes and also on the, on the nodes that are used to, to something really different to, to just store high loads of data. And to, to keep the performance uh, uh, in some range, it's good to have two instances. Sometimes it's good, if, if you have enough memory, it's good to separate uh, one instance into two. Uh, one is just running the application and another is providing the memory and both of them run on the same machine, so the overhead of communication is uh, much, much uh, less than uh, if uh, the data needs to be pulled over to, from, the, from a node on the network. Uh, I maybe still have some more time to do the demo, so I'll just show you quickly what's possible with Pyra. I just started uh, an application on, uh, on Pyre server. Uh, this is an administration console of the server which shows 
there is only one node in the cluster, it's the server uh, node, and the application is running there, I hope. Yes. But we can easily scale the application. Yeah, it provided the data. We can, we can easily scale the application by running another PyR micro instance, which is an executable jar, as I said. You can run it from command line. You can depot applications just like this. They don't have to be bundled together, but you can also bundle them in a, in a standalone jar. So I'll just run one instance of PyR micro. I run it as a, in, a, in a light mode so that I can use this argument. It limits the size of the memory to 200 megabytes. So these, uh, this additional instance will increase the throughput of our application, but it will not uh, con uh, store the memories. Memory will be still consumed on a, on a different node. What I can do with PyR Micro is also build an uh, executable jar with just uh, output Uber jar uh, option and the bundle the application together. So if I do this, I can run the same PyR Micro instance. Well, it's pretty slow because the other one is being started. But uh, uh, I can now run it like this. Just specify the, the JVM heap size and start it. And now, you can see in the console that we have one more instance and it should be light. Yes, light member two. And when we refresh, there should be another one, yes. So now we have three instances and what we can do now is to, they are automatically bound to next available port, and we can r access any of those instances now and distribute the load just, just like this. So I access the second and third uh, instance of, it's probably on different ports, yeah. So I have several instances running on different ports. If they are running on different machines, I can point the load balancer to all those machines and the request is uh, processed by separate computers and we can uh, easily increase the performance just spreading the request on multiple machines. Okay, so I'm running out of time, but I'm already done. I believe that we, if there, if we have some more questions, but it's already lunch time, so maybe you want to go to lunch. Yeah, if you have some more questions, just come to me after, after you go, after I finish, and we can talk. Thank you.